Today we're going to talk about none other than Middle Pier of Rush. Okay, so as a drummer, my favorite member of Rush has always been Neil Peart. Giddy and Alex are a close 2A and 2B. Some of the material that I put out on my channel all about Rush has been geared specifically to Neil. And I'd like to do that again, this time with a different focus. I'll be linking some of my videos that I've already done, you know, in the cards above or at the end of this video. But this time I wanted to focus on specifically Neil Peart's creativity. And the fact that a lot of times when drummers are covering these songs, they're like, uh oh, that part is coming. I hope I get it right. I'm just picking 10 or 10 instances. Of course, you know, we got over 170 songs or something like that. There's a bunch of examples of Neil Peart's creativity. In this video, I wanted to give 10 examples of why Neil Peart is my favorite drummer of all time why I hold him as one of the best drummers of all time. I want to make a clarification about something, and this battle goes on for like, it's been going on forever and ever. People saying that this drummer or that drummer is the best drummer. There's no such thing as the best drummer. There's no such thing as the best guitarist. There's no such thing as the best bass player. There's no such thing as the best keyboard player. There's no such thing as the best dad. Well, wait a minute, my kids say I'm the best dad, so... Maybe there is that. But although there isn't the best of the best, there is a level of greatness that we could call legendary that, you know, some drummers occupy. I would put Neil Peart in that echelon of drummers. I would put, for example, Buddy Rich as another example of drummers in that echelon. As far as popularity goes, I get a lot of slack for saying that Neil Peart is a better drummer than John Bonham. That's my opinion. But we could say, as far as rock goes, at least, John Bonham is way up there, legendary status drummer. So there are some of these drummers, and there are others. I mean, I'm not going to go, you know, go on on a whole spiel of the list of drummers that are legendary drummers. There, there's quite a few of them that are very unique, and they have their own style, and they have their own reasons for being as great as they were or as great as they are if they're still alive. And in Neil Peart's case, I've always contended that the reason why he's one of the best drummers of all time one of the greatest, a legend, epic, is that he's, he was so creative. He didn't require lots of technicality to come up with drum parts that leave the listener or the viewer mesmerized. And you watch a lot of drummers, excellent drummers, really technical drummers, flashy, fast, dizzying, technical, all this stuff. But if you see, if you got the privilege of seeing Neil play live in person, and you're watching him play, you just awestruck. And you can't always pinpoint why that is. He just had the it factor. He had it. Whatever it is, he had it. And how he was so specific in how he chose to play the drum parts and how he chose to tune his drums and how he chose to compose his drum parts in a creative way that was so that they became so unique to him. You hear those parts and you know that's Neil Peart. And not every drummer, not every great drummer is like that. For whatever reason. Again, I'm not saying Neil Peart is the best drummer of all time. I would never contend that because that's impossible to quantify. Because in that top section of drummers, greatest of all time, they all can do something that the other drummers can't do. And in Neil's case, I think those drummers are not as creative as him. Neil was not a session drummer. He was Rush's drummer. So everything he did was related to the songs that the three of them you know, Giddy and Alex writing the music. He didn't even write the music. He just added his drums later. He adapted what he, you know, his profession to that situation. Whereas if he was a session drummer, maybe like Steve Gadd, as an example, Steve Gadd might sound different in different situations because of what the band or the artist required of him. And he may sound different. Steve Smith is another example. He was, he's in various bands known for being in Journey, Vital Information, and other things. So he sounds different. You know, he's done a lot of clinics. He's done a lot of videos. Um, he's a very creative drummer as well, but in a different way. So let's put us, put aside the Neil Peart is the greatest drummer of all time. You say he's one of the best drummers of all time. You'd say he's legendary status drummer. If you want to argue that he's the best drummer of all time, you can do it. I'm not going to stop you, but 
I'll leave that to other people to do. But in any case, what we're here to do today, I'm picking 10 of Neil's most creative parts to me. When I looked through the catalog, I just picked what struck out at me, like what was obvious to me. And that's what I'm going to pick today. So here we go, finally. And these are in chronological order from oldest to newest. The first creative drum part I'm going to pick, one of his greatest, and I feature this in other videos, is his first drum solo in Vitor and the Snow Dog off of Fly By Night. What an incredible little drum solo that is. I've seen a lot of drummers try to imitate that little solo. I think I may have seen literally one, maybe two drummers play it exactly like Neil played it. It is for some reason, and it's single stroke rolls. I have another video of Neil Peart's single stroke rolls mastery of that one drum rudiment. Uh, he's so creative in making it sound completely different. By Turn the Snow Dog is an example of that. I find very few drummers know how to play that. Uh, I, to this day, I have a difficult time figuring out what he's, what he's doing. I uh, still someday I think I'm going to try, <laughs> but it's really hard. So By Turn the Snow Dog is my first example of one of Neil Peart's most creative drum parts. The second example I'm going to pick is from Natural Science off of Permanent Waves. I don't spend too much time on this. I mean, the drumming on that song, Natural Science, is incredible. This is one little snippet, and I'm going to play it right now. That really, uh, like, staccato, staggering, um, hit you in the face, start, stop, start, stop type of drumming. That Just that little segment, really difficult to imitate. Um, really difficult to, um, you know, to put the timing on what, you know, what's the time signature for that. Actually, that's not even that important, but the fact that it's so creative in that little time slot and, you know, the rest of the song continues. And I've compared that to some of the little drum parts that come up in YYZ, the next record. And I think actually this one is more complicated than any of the drum parts in YYZ. It's, um, really creative. Like it's almost like he did it on the fly, on the fly and it just came out right. But that little drum part on Natural Science, incredibly creative on his part. The next drum part, one of my favorite creatives of Neil on the drums, is Countdown on the Signals album. I think this is woefully underrated as one of Neil Peart's greatest drumming performances. Nobody talks about it, but I'm going to talk about it here. The song is a gymnastics exercise in drumming. He's all over the kit on this song. It's really important to hear this song with headphones or good speakers and loud <laughs> because there's certain when he, when Getty Lee towards the end of the song is singing the chorus for kind of the last time, Neil is actually going down the kit, hitting the lower toms. And then at the, at the end of that chorus, he's hitting that gong bass drum. And if you have good headphones or you have good speakers with some good bass, you're going to feel that gut punch of those gong bass drums at the end. He really uses the entire kit seamlessly on this song. And there's some like marching drum so uh, sound at the beginning. And it's just, you know, we know the building and the anticipation of what this song is. I think from a drummer's perspective, he does that as well throughout the whole song. And really is going up and down the kit. It's rare that you hear the gong bass drum in Rush's songs. I think he uses it more live. But in this particular song, that, that gong bass drum is the highlight for me. The way that Neil, even in the fade out, he's playing different parts. I would suggest taking a, another listen to Countdown off of Signals. The fourth song I'm going to pick that is an incredible example of, me, of Neil's creativity is Territories off of Power Windows. When I heard this song for the first time, I thought it was pretty good when I was hearing it at first. And then the chorus comes along and that is so creative on his part. He's playing the, the floor toms and going up on the high toms and then going to the floor toms and then going to the high toms. It just doesn't skip a beat. And it goes really nicely with how Getty is singing. So that little part, the whole song drumming wise is really creative, but the drumming during the chorus of Territories is very unique. And you'll note that a lot of these drum parts that we talk about throughout this list, they're unique. They only happen that time. And you won't hear them in, in any other place in Russia's discography. But that just shows the incredible creativity and depth of knowledge that Neil had on the drums from a creative and compositional perspective. 
that I think surpasses almost every drummer. And like I mentioned before, other drummers are better at doing certain things than Neil was. But as far as creativity, he nails it yet again during the song Territories, especially during the chorus. Next song I want to talk about that exemplifies Neil's creativity is the song Mission on the next record, Hold Your Fire. Mission is a fan favorite because of the emotional aspect. But during the instrumental part of the song, actually all three of them are jamming pretty well. But the part where Neil incorporates the xylophone sound during that instrumental, I call it instrumental breakdown. I don't know if that's the right expression. You can correct me in the comments. When you're hearing him using the xylophone and snare drum when they're when he's playing that kind of little solo part, and Alex is doing that kind of a facial type guitar, and then all three of them jam jam out, and then you know there's silence basically. And you just hear the keyboards. But that instrumental breakdown where Neil is using both the snare and the xylophone at the same time. And of course, you can't do that really unless you program it. And in live versions of Mission, he's just playing on the xylophone or the uh, MIDI marimba, whatever he, whatever he called it. But again, very creative. When I heard that for the first time, I go, oh, wow, that's, that's really cool. Never heard him do something like that where he's incorporating both the snare sound and the xylophone sound at the same time. And even though he didn't do it live again, you know, it's easy to do the, that kind of stuff in the studio. But again, another creative thing from him that he really didn't do any other time. Next drum creative drum part that I want to talk about from Neil is off of yet the next record, which is uh, Presto, and the song is Scars. This is very interesting because the drumming in Scars Neil incorporated in his drum solos um, pretty much during every tour. I don't know if he did it during the Vapor Trails tour, and I don't, he didn't do it in the R40 tour. Pretty much every tour, he incorporated the drumming in Scars in his drum solos. So in R30, for example, that tour where a song was played from every record except Presto, but, but the drum solo had the drumming from Scars in it. So you could say that Presto was represented in that tour via the drum solo. And very interesting how Neil talks about the mood of that drumming. It's kind of like tribal, jungle-like. You know, there's a call and response type of drumming. Again, super creative. Stuff that you don't hear any other drummer do. You hear it from him. And the incredible independence and control that he has. He has all his four limbs flailing around. And it's a steady beat. Absolutely incredible. The drumming from the song Scars on Presto, yet another example of Neil's outstanding creativity. Next example I want to give of Neil's creativity is on yet the next record, Roll the Bones, and the song is Bravado. This is very interesting. So previously, Neil had the, his drum kit had two bass drums. But from Roll the Bones forward, his drum kit had a single bass drum with a double pedal. So what that allowed him to do, since now he had one less big drum, he kind of like analyzed his drum kit and he figured, oh, I can put another floor tom to my left. In addition to the one I already have, the ones I have on my right. So what that allowed him to do was come up with completely new drum parts that incorporated both the floor tom to his right and now the floor tom to his left which was not there before the roll the bones studio record that allowed him to, to come up with the creative drumming that he did on bravado it's a masterpiece of independence drumming showing uh, how you know each limb is doing something really you know responsible for doing something completely different but it being in time and incorporating the two side floor toms that he didn't have before to just create something absolutely beautiful and masterful. So Bravado is an example of him creating something new because now he had new toys to play with. So that's my seventh example. Yes. We'd like to carry on the song. Uh, it's also from Counterparts. This song is, uh, I guess, could only be described as demented. This is... Uh, called Double Agent. I really like Double Agent. Very unique. Giddy liked to call this song Demented. They only played it during the Counterparts tour. This is an interesting 
song drum wise as well. For one thing, Neil does not use the hi hat at all in that song. He just doesn't use it. What he's doing instead, he's just writing the China symbol and the right symbol alternatively during the verses. And the way he's dancing around the the beat with the snare and the bass drum throughout the whole song, it's just it's different. It's like it's not like a straight four beat disco beat type of thing. It's just very like you know jolting right and interestingly enough as he's not using his hi-hat at all and he's using the china and ride symbol to keep the beat during most of the song he's using the china hitting the china symbol on the down beat and the ride symbol on the upbeat and then during the outro verse he switches it he's now hit it using the right symbol as the down beat and the china symbol on the upbeat so he reverses it so any drummer who tries to imitate that, they have to like almost learn the song completely again <laughs> because he changes it up at the end. Again, it's another masterful display of him coming up with a drum part and varying it, varying the same motif within the same song, just flipping it over. And if you listen to the verse in the beginning of the song and listen to the last verse, you'll, no you'll notice the difference in Neil Peart's playing. So Double Agents off of Counterparts, another great example of Neil's creativity. The ninth example I want to give of Neil Peart's creativity is Test for Echo, the whole record. I think Test for Echo is a much maligned record. There seems to be a lot of people who don't like it, but let's set aside the record as a whole and just take a look at the drumming on this record. It is outstanding. Uh, he switches to traditional grip because of the transformation of his style of drumming, which uh, to me, was a new era for him, for him from that point forward. Uh, the Neil Peart that we knew from counterparts and back, that's gone. And we have this more refined, more jazzy like drummer who's playing rock. Whereas before you had a rock drummer who they threw in a little jazz here and there, but hardly ever. Now he's sounding more jazzy, but you know, he still had the power of it was Neil. He's still Neil, Neil Peart. But this test for, e test for echo record. Whether it was because he switched to the traditional grip, I don't think so. I, I think it was part of it, but it just made him play more groovy. He was a more groovy drummer. What they call in the pocket is definitely in the pocket in this record. It, he was just a, he was a different drummer, and just the fact that he did that, and we have the example from his A Work in Progress VHS slash DVD where he explains every single song, how he played it, why he chose to play it certain drum parts the way he did it is a master class of creativity and, and getting into the mind of neil as far as when he's coming up with a drum part why he plays that right symbol there why he chose to hit the china this certain china symbol once on the whole record that was a creative decision why did he do that well stuff like that and the fact that he switched over to traditional grip for the whole record he didn't do that again he played your traditional grip more in subsequent records, but never a whole record. It was just this one, Test for Echo. Absolutely creative, the whole thing. So if you want to see more of how creative Neil was for Test for Echo, you can listen to just the songs and just notice how groovy the drumming is. Or you can watch the Work in Progress DVD and watch him explain how he selected all of his drum parts. And again, a masterclass in creativity. And the last example I want to give uh, regarding Neil Peart's creativity, him being one of the best, if not the best creative drummer of all time, is Headlong Flight from Clockwork Angels. That whole record is, is a lot. Of, there's a lot of creative drumming going on there. I'm picking this one because this record kind of came back to a really heavy rock type sound. Neil, now in his 60s more or less, around there in 2012. Man, he was hitting those drums hard. <laughs> Man, Headlong Flight, when you hear the studio version, definitely sounds harder and rockier than in the live versions. There's a lot of different changes and different drum parts throughout the song, especially during the verses, the verses and bridges. He, every time those different motifs came back musically, he's doing a different pattern every single time. And I actually made a video of my difficulties trying to cover that song. And <laughs> it took me so long 
to learn how to play that song because he was doing something different practically. Uh, every four bars, he was doing something different. And if it, the music was the same, in another part of the song, he's drumming differently. Even the way he was hitting the toms, the way he was hitting the china, he was, the way he was riding, he, it was, you know, he's just all over the place. And then the, there's the drum solo in the middle where it sounds like he's hitting a lot of drums, but it's he's hitting mostly uh, a tom and a snare, just alternating between the two. And that's something that I've always found hard to do. So I threw in some other stuff in my interpretation of that part. But again, at his age, I, I don't know of a drummer that is creative and really hard hitting at the same time, the way he was, particularly in this song, and particularly, particularly in that whole record. Just amazing. What a way to go out if that was their intent. If Clockwork Angels was to be their last record, okay, good. I mean, what? Could they have done better than that one? Maybe at their age, probably not. I think they knew that the end was near in that regard. Maybe. So there you have it. Those are my 10 examples of Neil Peart's greatness as far as composition and creativity go. And you, all of these examples, he doesn't repeat any of them in any, any other songs. We can go through several more examples, several more videos, 10 at a time, of all of these creative decisions that Neil made that just made the songs so much fuller. Because remember, three members, they each had a lot to do to make, to create a grand sound. And I think, I think as far as a three piece goes, each one of them filled the space quite well. Neil was an absolute genius, legend at creating drum parts that not only fit the song, but were very musical. That was another thing I was going to say. One of the most musical drummers ever. Very musical. It's almost like he was more a musical drummer than a rhythmic drummer, which almost every drummer is a rhythmic drummer because drums are rhythm. But there are some drummers that are very musical, but he's definitely in that group. He's one of the most musical drummers that there ever have been. So I'm going to call it for now. Please subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. Click the like button and I will see you in the next video.